Hello, hello. Welcome to the All In Podcast with Nate Pale. This is a, another episode. Our guest today is Carrie Schwer, founder of Grey Tonic and the Question the Drink movement. I found Carrie through LinkedIn, scrolling through some posts, and she was talking about this gray area drinking where it's really, if you um, are, you know, you have alcohol in your life and you're not sure about your relationship with it, you're not um, a full blown alcoholic and needing of recovery, but you're definitely consuming more than you uh, feel comfortable with. So you start questioning your your relationship around alcohol. It's something I'm passionate about. Something I've struggled with. It's something I've been going through is eliminating alcohol in my life and seeing the positive impacts of it. And through being vocal and being open about it, I realize that there's a lot of people in the same place as me who um, aren't quite sure how they feel about it. They don't. They don't see that they have had a major problem that we haven't hit rock bottom, uh, but we know that our life could be better without it. So I wanted to give a voice to that message. And Carrie is a wonderful, wonderful coach um, that helps people through it. And I couldn't help but uh, ask her to be on the show. So hope you enjoy. Um, as always, please subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or your favorite platform. And if you found value in it, it'd be very, very helpful if you just told two people who you know that might like this message. Anyways, on with the show. Want to go far in business and in life? You can't do it alone. The secret is expanding your network of personal relationships, building friendships, connecting on an intimate level, away from the office, over a coffee or cocktail. Welcome to All In with Nate Payo. The show that asks what happens when you go all in and leverage the power of your network of personal relationships. Hello, hello. Welcome to the All In Podcast with Nate Pale. I am your host, Nate Pale. Today's uh, guest is somebody uh, super special to me and somebody I've only known a brief period of time, but I've gotten to know really, really well over the last couple of weeks. And that's Carrie Schreer with Question the Drink. Welcome to the show, Carrie. Hi, thank you for having me, Nate. Glad to be here. Well, I'm glad you could come. So I'll give you a little backstory of how I came across Carrie, and that was <clears throat> on LinkedIn. So some of you that know me personally know that um, probably back in October of, ni- of 2019, I decided to quit drinking alcohol as part of the 75 Hard Challenge. And for me, when I when I decided to do that, I I had just not been happy with my relationship with alcohol, not in the sense that I had an alcoholic problem, but I was consuming more uh, and a lot more often than, than I wanted to. I was like, you know, two or three drinks every night, five to seven nights a week. And on the weekends, maybe two or three would turn into five to six over the course of the day. Nothing where I'd get blackout drunk and miss uh, work or miss obligations, but I would, I would just not be happy with the, what I was doing. It was causing me to gain weight and I felt a bit lethargic and just not living up to what I thought was my potential. So when I found this 75 hard challenge, which is a whole bunch of other rules, but the one that stood out to me was not drinking. So I gave up alcohol for like 60 plus days. I didn't complete the 75 hard challenge. I failed at it. But during that, those 60 plus days of not drinking, I was very I guess, vocal. I was very open with it on social media. And I hadn't been before um, as a person on social media talking about, you know, my skeletons in the closet, you might say. So I started getting a lot of feedback from people saying, hey, I'm in the same boat as you where I go to these events or I go on the weekend, I'm just drinking to drink, but I don't really want to, but I just do it because that's what I've always done. It's always been a part of my life and I hadn't really... um, wanted to do it but I just did it and and I and I we all were kind of related on this thing and so fast forward to January February I had started drinking again we had uh, missed on, on Christmas Eve it was actually I started I had some drinks on Christmas Eve and I said you know what I'll just do a little bit here and then I'll tack on a day at the end of my 75 heart challenge and and then I'll just you know say I did 75 days of no drinking and I'll you know won't complete the challenge as, as prescribed and wouldn't get the, you know, the merit badge for it. But I at least say I went 75 days without drinking with one Nessa, but that didn't happen. January came and January turned into what I was going to call a month of moderation of only a couple of drinks a week, nothing more than, you know, two or three for the whole week. 
again, February or January came through, moderation didn't happen. And February was kind of rolling into this, like, I got to do something. All the gains I had from not drinking are coming back. I'm starting to get bloated. I'm starting to be unhappy. I'm starting to be lethargic. And at the same time, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm trying to connect with people. I'm trying to build, you know, some followings and people I could relate to um, for the podcast that I was creating. And I came across Carrie's profile, uh, popped up in my feed. And she had a post on there that said, question the drink. So immediately I was like, what is this about? And she talks in, in her post about moderation and consuming in moderation. She talks about, you know, people that um, don't necessarily have a completely alcohol problem where they're, you know, blackout drunk seven nights a week and they get the shakes in the morning, but more of this, like, Hey, I just, I drink too often. I drink more than I want to drink, but I can't control it. I can't, you know, cut back on it. And there's always a temptation and maybe it's like overeating or not sticking to a diet. And I was thinking, I'm going to reach out to her. I want to see what she's up to. I want to see what she's doing with it. So I sent her a message and say, Hey, let's, I'm very interested in what you got going on. One, because I've been through this before where you don't necessarily have a uh, defined problem by say society standards, but internally, you know, you're not at your best. And two, I, because I was doing that and was vocal about it, I had noticed a lot of people reached out to me in private and said, Hey, I'm in the same boat as you. And I wanted to, at the very least, just say, Hey, I want to talk with you about it. I want to know how I can share your message because people need to hear that there, there's a lot of people like them that struggle with alcohol use and their relationship with it because it's not completely detrimental to their life, but it's not healthy either, if that makes sense. So I reached out to Carrie, we connected and, and, and since then we've had lots of conversations about this topic and she's helped me kind of reconcile a lot of the ins and outs, the pinging and the ponging in my head of why I choose to drink or why I want to drink and trying to help me come to terms with that, whether it's something that I want to eliminate completely out of my life or whether it's something that I can find a place, find a relationship with it that's that's a healthy one, that's not uh, depend, like it's not something that's constantly in my mind if I'm going to drink or if I'm not going to drink tonight. So that's, that's my backstory of how I met Carrie. I'm sure she's got a lot to say on that too. So I'm going to let you kind of get your take on how we met. Hey, Nate. Well, thanks for sharing your story. I think that's really helpful and relatable to a lot of people, right? So what I specialize in is something that I refer to as gray area drinking. And gray area drinking is a relatively new term. It's been out for about four or five years now. And it really means somebody who is more than moderately drinking, but not quite an alcoholic or somebody that we would refer to as an alcoholic or severely abusing alcohol. They're sort of in this in-between stage and they know that they're drinking more than they should. And a lot of times it's a secret questioning that they have, this deep inner voice that is kind of nagging at them a little bit like, hey, I think you're drinking too much. And they're just not quite sure what to do. And because of that, these gray area drinkers, which I identify as a former gray area drinker, don't usually have a rock bottom. They're high functioning. They can, you know, hold down a job and hold down a marriage and nothing really detrimental has happened to them in their life. But like I said, they do know that they're drinking more than they should be or on occasion. Um, and they're having a hard time coming to terms with that. And because there's such a stigma with somebody who is quote unquote an alcoholic or severely, severely abusing alcohol, the gray area drinker most likely doesn't reach out for help. They like to just try to figure things out on their own. They try to moderate on their own thinking that's going to be uh, something that they can do successfully. But in reality, they find out that that's not as easy as they think it is. <clears throat> or they go a week or two without drinking just to prove to themselves that they don't have a serious problem, but then ends up going back to drinking after that couple week time frame. So there's a lot of misconceptions regarding problematic drinking, which is why my passion and my mission is to really bring awareness to what gray area drinking is so that the people that do fall in this gray area can make an empowering choice and a decision to do something about it before they fall too far down into the traps of addiction. 
So that's the main reason why I started uh, my business, why I started a coaching practice and why it is so important to me to get this message out to help as many people as I possibly can. So you, you mentioned there that you, you had been a gray area drinker in your past. What, like, could you tell your story of, you know, your moment when you decided that you said, Hey, uh, I, th- I feel like I have a problem and I want to make a change and do something different. Cause I think a lot of us there in this spot have this, like, you know, maybe tomorrow it's maybe tomorrow. It's not that bad. You know, I, I know people a lot worse. I don't, like you said, I don't have a problem with it yet. And it's not, it's not necessarily maybe something that's going to turn to addiction, but it's like, Hey, there's, um, somebody's having a barbecue on Saturday afternoon. Like I'm going to go and I'm probably going to have two or three beers because that's what you do. Or I have a work event tonight. Um, I'm probably gonna have two or three drinks there because, you know, how do you, you know, kind of like let loose a blow off steam if you're not having a few drinks and those two drinks here, three drinks there turns into, you know, five, six, seven nights a week. And all of a sudden that's a lot more, uh, than you wanted to consume when you're trying to be moderate. So what, like, how did you arrive at that? Yeah, that's a great question. So for me, it was something that happened over a 10 year period. What started off with just one glass of wine in the evening, led to two glasses, led to three glasses. And eventually, you know, when you're at three and a half glasses, you might as well say, screw it and drink the whole bottle, (laughs) which is where I was at. So that took a long time for me to get to that point. But what was happening was, you know, three, three to four glasses was my minimum every single evening after work, never drank during the day, held a very high, you know, high position job and never had anything negative happen because of my drinking other than me feeling like crap every morning. And then saying to myself, that's it. You're not going to drink anymore. And by two o'clock in the afternoon, I'm like, Hmm, what do I want for dinner? I, let's see, I really in the mood for white wine. I guess I'm going to have either seafood or chicken because I want white wine and vice versa with red wine. So I was literally planning my meals around what I was craving. And at that point I knew, oh my gosh, this is like getting out of hand. So I came to my personal enough, which we all can have our own definition of what that means. For everybody, it is something different. For me, it was, I was tired of being tired. I was sick of lying to myself and to my family and my friends. I had an altercation with my youngest son said some very negative things to him. And as a mother, it was uh, devastating to me to hear back what I had said to him one of the nights that I was completely loaded. So that was my personal enough that drove me to figure this out. And I went the traditional route. I didn't know any anybody like me that existed back then. So I went to AA. I love the program when I was in it. I was in it for about two to three months on a consistent basis. I did all the things you're supposed to do, Nate. I got a sponsor. I read the big book. I did this 12-step program. But for me, after you know three months of this, of saying, hi, I'm Carrie and I'm an alcoholic, was not resonating with me and who I wanted to become. And I knew at that point that I needed something different, something that was going to be edifying to my soul And it was going to keep me leveling up as opposed to making me feel like I was forever broken or powerless. And that there is another reason why people choose not to go to a 12 step program or or recovery because they don't want to be forever labeled. They don't want to be put into this bucket. And so they refuse to get help. So after I, I left the program, I worked with the life coach. That experience really changed my life. That opened me up to new possibilities which is why I decided to become a coach myself. And so I could offer those same life-changing benefits to my clients. But I think as far as having a rock bottom, that really depends on that individual and what they consider their own personal enough. And that looks different for everybody. And a lot of people don't even need to come to their enough. My hope and my mission is to reach people and bring this awareness and this education to them so they can see it before they end up getting too far down into their addiction, like I said, because here's the thing. Once you start to recognize that you have a problem or that you are drinking more than what is considered standard or a moderate acceptable amount, you can't ignore it. At that point, you have a responsibility to yourself, to your loved ones, to make a decision on what you're going to do. You can choose to ignore it and continue to drink. And guess what? It only progresses. It never gets easier. 
Or you can choose to look at it, attack it, understand it, come to the real reasons why you're choosing to drink in the first place, which is why Question the Drink is such a, a great place for people to be. It's a private Facebook group for those that want to join because it gives you the opportunity to get really clear and honest with the reasons why you're choosing to do the behavior in the first place. Mm-hmm. And, with this, and with societies, you know, there, with this whole societal view regarding alcohol, as we all know, it's so accepted and it's almost at the point where it's expected And my mission is to really change that because it shouldn't be expected. It's okay that a lot of people drink. I'm not opposed to people drinking, but I am opposed to people expecting others to drink. And I think there needs to be some support for those choosing not to drink that are more sober curious, that are mindfully drinking and that want to get healthy and have more of a clean living lifestyle. And that's what I'm proposing. And that's what I like to offer. Yeah. And, and you talk a little bit about like rock bottom. You talked about go, people going to Alcoholics Anonymous. And this is what stood out to me when I, when I first saw your, your profile was that like you had a different message that I hadn't heard before. Like everything I'd heard before, and I've been to AA for, um, it's not something I've ta- told a lot of people, but I had a DUI in 2004 and I had to go to um, AA classes as part of my um, probation and i'll give a little backstory to it so like um i got drunk at a at a at a bar in um hollywood and decided like i didn't want to sleep in my car and i decided i'd drive home from uh, hollywood to where i live which is about two hours away and I, in, the, in my mind, the thought was like, hey, I'm going to do this drive home because I drive this home for work all the time. Like, I just get home, I'll be tired, but I'll, I got the next day to sleep it off. And so I guess, you know, about, I don't know, 20 minutes from getting to the house, I, I blacked out and passed out and hit a guardrail and spun out of control. And luckily, nobody was killed. Nobody was hurt, um, but the police showed up and found me and said, hey, you've been drinking. We're going to throw you in jail for the night. And at that point, I didn't feel like I had hit rock bottom. I was like, oh, man, that sucks. I had this DUI and I started to go through things, but I, was, I wasn't like come to terms with that, that thing. And then I started going to like AA classes of this requirement. And I go, no, I just made a bad mistake. I just made a poor decision in the moment, but I'm not nearly as fucked up as these other people in this class. I mean, not saying that they're effed up, but it's like, you know, they're talking about stories of like they're drinking vodka straight out of the bottle at 7 a.m. Or they, you know, if they opened up one beer, they'd have 15. And I was like, that's not me. I know how, like, if I'm going out, like, sure, there's nights I tie one on and go all out. But a lot of times, hey, I'm two or three, I'm no problem. And I was like, I just don't relate. I don't identify with myself as being an alcoholic. And so it goes to this thing of like what you identify yourself as. And so when you start thinking about how you identify as, then you start making your choices because of it. So I've identified myself as a drinker, as a partier, as a fun person that cuts one back and has a good time. So when I would go to events, I'd be like, this is me. I do these things. I drink these I drink because it makes me more fun. It makes me more sociable and I identify with it. You talked about like, you know, you're a wine chick and it's like, think of all the fun wine sayings. You could buy stuff for your house. You could buy fun wine glasses. You got it's wine o'clock somewhere. It's like, there's always that stuff of like how much it is. And there's this romance of this food, this wine, these people having a good time. And you're just like, I have to have my alcohol to, to be this there's part of it. And, and you start going, you start looking at it and you go, but I don't feel like I'm the happiest when I'm consuming alcohol. There's a moment in the, in the, in time of like a 24 hour period where like, you know, an hour, hour and a half, I'm like at this like peak, like I'm the best. And then you start going over the edge a little too much and you, and you wake up the next day and you go, okay, from about seven to eight thirty, I was like feeling good. I had a nice, good buzz, and I was in control. About eight thirty, I started feeling like I had too much, and I don't really remember much past nine thirty. And now I feel like shit. So, like, you're giving up a whole bunch of your day for like this real brief window of living your best life. And I think you can find a way to live your best life without alcohol or in a place that works for you. I'm not against it either. Like I'm not in a drinking state right now. I don't know for sure if that'll be the rest of my life or or not, but 
um, I'm kind of going all over and losing my tra- train of thought, but what I wanted to talk about was that identification of who we are. And when you realize like, Hey, you can still be that person you want to be that you use alcohol to be without it. Well, a couple of things with that. It's, it's the story that we create in our mind is who we say we are. It's as simple as that. So when we, when you had mentioned like, you know, you're the party guy, you're the one who's, who is a drinker. You're the one who's, you know, gets the party going and gets people to drink and have fun and all that. That's just the story that we're telling ourselves. And that's not necessarily the truth. And so part of the problem that we all get caught up in is we allow our thoughts that come into our mind to create these feelings that provoke some sort of behavior. And that truly is, is the basis of, of what is happening for all of us as a human behavior. This is how it works, that we allow um, a story to create and decide for us what we're going to be doing as far as our behavior is concerned. So I'll give you an example. If you believe, like you mentioned, that you were X, Y, or Z, then that's what, who you become. So, you know, if you tell yourself over and over again that you're a purple dinosaur, at some point you might start to believe it. And it's as mm-hmm. ridiculous as that sounds, which is why going to, you know, a 12 step program and somebody saying, Hi, I'm an alcoholic, and they're claiming that label for themselves, they're for, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. For people in recovery, if that works for them, that works for them. And there's no judgment. It's absolutely what works for somebody. But for most people, they want to believe that they're powerful because what feels better that you feel in, in control and powerful over your own self and what the story you're telling yourself. So which is why it's really important for us to remain extremely careful with the words that we're choosing to say about ourselves and not necessarily have a quote unquote label. So even though I, I just said I identify as a former gray area drinker, it's not that I'm putting a label on that. It's saying that this is a type of category that I feel I belonged, that I fell into. And so in, in my eyes, in my view, my, my point of view, is that there are four types of drinkers. You have somebody who is an abstinent drinker. You have somebody who's a social drinker, very, social, you know, very much of a social drinker, moderate drinker. Then you have the, this wide bucket of the gray area drinkers. And then you have this severely abusing alcohol category where an alcoholic would fall into. And more people fall in this gray area, which there lies the, the non-identification because that could mean many things. That could mean the binge drinker only on the weekends. That could be, um, you had mentioned earlier about when you went to a meeting and you're like, oh my God, these people are, they're so much worse off than I am. You went into comparison mode. And that also gets us into trouble when mm-hmm. we start to compare ourselves to other types of, of people and what they're doing. It doesn't matter what they're doing. It matters what you're doing. And everything we do, Nate, in our life always comes down to a decision. We have the capacity and the power to make our own choices and our decision. And that all comes from a belief. So if we believe that we can do it, and if we believe that we can... Um, choose to moderate drinking, then possibly you could. It's not for everybody. Mm -hmm. Not everybody who's drinking heavily can moderate successfully. And so for me, who's been sober for a number of years now, could I go back to drinking and be successful? Quite possibly. But am I choosing to? Absolutely not. And the reason why is because there's no point for me to do that, Mm -hmm. to prove it to myself that I could. Because my life right now without alcohol in it is extremely awesome. And it's so rich. And to be in full control and full power and have clarity is much more fun and much more important to me than, you know, getting a buzz every night for a couple of hours and then just drink myself till it's time to go to bed. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, and it, what I was going to say is like, when well, there's two things I wanted to say is is the first is like when you when you're in this gray area drinking and you choose not to drink versus being maybe a alcoholic and you, you are in recovery. So in this gray area, if you're just choosing not to drink, it doesn't mean you're limiting your lifestyle. You probably are still doing the things you would have done anyways that alcohol is a part. Like if your friends are going out Absolutely. to the bar for the night. You don't not go because you're not sure if you're in control or not, or if there's going to be, you know, a wine tasting party with the girls. Like, do you still go to those events? Um, 
it's that's a great question, by the way. That's a really good question. Nobody's ever asked me that, and and I think it's important. So in the beginning, I chose not to. I did not go to anything that I felt was jeopardizing my success to remain alcohol free. Um, so I chose not to do that. Now, ironically, I quit just before. I know I sound like I'm super young, but I'm in my fifties. But I quit drinking before my 50th birthday. And I had planned this huge vacation with, with two other couples. And I was petrified because these, these other couples that were going are all drinkers and, and, you know, they drink a lot. And we were going to an all-inclusive resort in, in the Caribbean. And right away I went into panic mode, but I made the decision that I was going to remain alcohol free because that's what I wanted to do. And I did it. Now, did I have a, a day that I really struggled a little bit, I sure did. But I, I remembered my goals and my reasons why I was choosing this, that it was my decision to do it. And I got through that time frame. How did, now, how did, how did they, re- when you told your friends that like, hey, I'm not going to be drinking, were they supportive or were they like, ah, come on, you know, the peer pressure they, we always hear about? Oh, no, they were very supportive. They've never pressured me, uh, not once. I think that the the paradigm shift for me and for a lot of people that choose not to drink is that if your friends are your friends, they're going to be your friends no matter what, which was the case in, in for me. But the other kind of flip side to that is that as you see your friends continue to drink and get sloppy drunk and, and lose control of themselves, and you are not losing control, you tend to not have as much patience as you maybe once have had in the past regarding that type of behavior. So what happened was for me personally, I started pulling myself back a little bit from, from certain friends, not all, but some only because I felt like that's not where I wanted to be anymore. And mm-hmm. this isn't against anybody who does drink or any of my friends. Cause I'm still friends with a lot of people that still drink a lot. Right. It's not that we're not friends anymore, but my tolerance level has changed the type of friends that I want to have maybe has changed. I think there's just a different paradigm shift. But when you're in the midst of it, when you're in the trenches of trying to figure this out, all that seems so scary. The number one reason why people choose not to drink or not to give up drinking rather is because they're so worried about losing out on a social life. It's the FOMO effect, right? Mm -hmm. Fear of missing out, fear of missing out on the fun and the friends and the social life and all the, all the quote unquote, you know, exhilarating things that you can do while drinking, but all those things that you can do while drinking, you can do not drinking and still have a great time. And as a matter of fact, you find that you actually have more fun because you remember everything. You're not paranoid. You're not worried about driving home drunk. You're not worried about drunk texting. You're not worried about saying something stupid that you're going to look like an idiot the next day. Mm -hmm. Right? So there's like this relaxation that comes over you knowing that you're in full control. And you actually have more fun because you remember everything. Yeah. And, and I think that's why I wanted to bring a lot of attention to this topic. Me personally, it was, was because of the people that reached out. And for me, like when I was first thinking about doing it, I was af- afraid to say anything because I was like, well, what will people think? Will they be understanding? Will I be like an outcast or will I be like, Oh, he's on his high horse now, judging all of us or having fun and good time. But I was surprised how many people were super supportive. How many people are like, you know, I don't even drink at these things. I was like, really? I thought you guys are all drinkers at these things. Like, no, I I don't drink. And I had no idea. And what I like realized is that nobody cares. Like people like you for you. I mean, most of the people I'm around with, like, they they tend to be very positive and very supportive and they just think, Hey, that's your choice. I'm not going to make you, you know, they're not going to sit there and tell me to eat. Um, you know, if I, everybody's ordering hamburgers, I get a salad. They don't give me crap about that. So why would they give me uh, crap about choosing to drink or not to drink? Nobody was, was really on me. So I wanted to give that idea of like, Hey, you, you can, you can, there's people out there like you. There's people out there that have this un, a healthy relationship with alcohol for them, whatever that is, it's just more than they want in their life, which could be a little, could be a lot, it could be any amount that they just say, Hey, I don't And where they go. And they talk, talk when you start talking to like people that are your like close friends or your support group. And you say, Hey, I'm going to, I think I'm, I think I'm drinking too much. I think I want to cut back a drink. 
everybody always tells you, what, you? You don't have a problem. Like, it, you don't drink that much. Like, you go, well, I drink, you know, I drank like four, four beers last night by myself. Eh, that happens, you know, no big deal. Did You show up for work. You didn't have a hangover. You were fine. You didn't do anything outlandishly stupid. And they'll go like, look at those other people at that other party that was at, and they were like so much drunker than you were. And she just like, like, <laughs> so, so people like give you this, like, Hey, like you, they, they like reinforce you saying like, Hey, you don't have a problem because you think you do. So then you don't know where to go turn for help. Cause people are telling you like, you don't have, it's like, if you're a bad alcoholic and you ask people to have a problem, they will tell you. Like, yes, you have a problem. You need help. That's why there's interventions because people are like absolutely good for surfing your help. But when you're in this space of like, hey, you know, you're just eating too much. Like nobody goes up and says like, hey, I've, I've noticed you've put on like 20 pounds. Like maybe you should, you should start dieting a little bit. Like nobody says that, but because you're not getting into this morbidly obese thing, but you're also maybe not taking care of yourself as much as you would personally like to take care of yourself. So you're not getting the support of, Hey, I'm going to go explore this side of me. That's going to become a better version of myself. Cause I don't, I don't, I don't know where to begin. I don't know where to start. So when I found your, your stuff, I was like, I got to find out what's going on because this is like nothing I've ever seen before. Yeah. Well, it is true. And you brought something up that a lot of people who do drink don't care if you don't we get in our heads as, as having a, a problem with drinking as this, but the truth of the matter is that people who are your friends that are continuing to drink, they don't care if you're not drinking. They just don't care. We think that they care, but they, they really don't. And mm-hmm. the ones who do care, if they say anything to you, that's because they have a problem with their relationship with alcohol, most likely. Those are the only people who actually would, would have a problem with you not drinking is because they don't want you, they don't want to feel like they're not going to have much fun if you're not drinking, mm-hmm. right? So that that's the reality of it. But okay. as far as, yeah, as far as, um, you know, having fun and, and going out and all those things, you can still do all those wonderful things. And the thing of it is, there's so many people out there that are starting to become very wise to the health conscious reasons of not drinking and the benefits of not drinking that it's almost refreshing when you find somebody who is also in that same situation. And it's like, yes, oh my gosh, I don't feel pressured. Like I have to drink mm-hmm. tonight. Right. And you can just be who you want to be. So I think that's awesome. And I love that this is starting to happen more and more for us in society, that people are starting to wake up to the reality that you don't need to drink to have fun. Yeah. And there's, there's a movement for mocktails and non-alcoholic beverages and other things that are specifically geared towards people that want to go out. They just don't want to have the effects of, of alcohol. Uh, maybe it's starting with the millennials and the Gen Zers of choosing not to drink, but there's, there's definitely other options out there. Now, this is a sh- <clears throat> show about networking. So I wanted to get some input from you on like, for a lot of people, networking means there's an open bar. Networking means there's a cocktail. Like you always meet somebody in line getting a drink while you're waiting in line to get a drink. That's where like a lot of times a conversation happens or you're nervous. So you're hanging out by the bar. You get a drink and you hold it in your hand. So how do you transition from being a drinker to a non-drinker going to networking events and you're in here building a business to talk about not drinking? So you're probably at places where people are drinking and they're like, Oh gosh, this lady's probably judging me because I have a drink in my hand and she's talking to me (laughs) about not drinking. And like, all of a sudden it's like, like how, how, how did you navigate that, that space? Well, I didn't put so much emphasis on it again. I think for me in the very early stages, and I think this is very normal, you're so aware and conscious of the fact that you're, that yourself, you're not drinking. So you're more concerned about what other people are thinking about you. But I, you know, my encouragement to anybody who's in that situation is to just take a deep breath, order something that you may not feel like you're out of place, so to speak. You know, for me, it's a club soda and cranberry with a lime. Looks like I'm drinking, you know, a mixed drink or there's great non-alcoholic beers on the market. You could order one of those. There's a lot of options that you can do. And you're just, you're just going with the flow. I think a lot of this is the stories that we're creating in our minds that people are judging us or that we, they think that we're judging them. And, 
I'm telling you, none of that is really true. It's just not. I think that we create stories because we're so we're so paranoid, but that's not really what's happening. I think when you are engaging, the importance of networking is to really get to know that other person for who they are by asking questions, by paying attention, by listening, by looking at their eyes, by remembering what they say, uh, remembering what their name is, repeating it back to them. And if guess what? If you're intoxicated, you can't do that successfully. Mm-hmm. So you're a better networker if you're if you're not drinking and you're able to carry a conversation in a very productive way and you sound intelligent and not sloppy and you know it's embarrassing. I mean, I mm-hmm. embarrassed myself multiple times at events. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I said I said oh shit in front of 700 people with their head bowed for a prayer. <laughs> oh, I kid boy. you not. Oh yeah, it was bad. So <laughs> I've I've had my share of embarrassments with with drinking at, at events. So you know, I, I think it's more about what's going on really versus what we're telling ourselves that's going on. Okay. Well, I, like I said, I wanted to bring a lot of attention to this, um, this topic, because it means a lot to me to share it with people that you don't have to have alcohol in your life if you choose to. And I think when you start identifying things you want to change about your life, you become a bit more aware of what's around you. And because you're a bit more aware, not just like these things appear because you're thinking of them, but they appear like in the sense of like, if you're thinking about a white Mustang, you're going to start seeing white Mustangs driving on the freeway. And we start thinking about like, Hey, you know, I, I want to explore sober curious. I love that idea. Sober curious, because you're just like, Hmm, what would be my life be uh, sober, you know, and, and I still don't like that word sober because it sounds so boring, so stiff. So like, yeah, uh, but, yeah I agree. But, <laughs> but, but, but it's like you sober curious is like, Hey, I, I still, I, I can, I can live a life I want to live without alcohol. But when you start thinking about these things, you start noticing other people are into the same things as you. And lo and behold, somebody like yourself is going to pop up through your feed or you're going to bump into somebody that does it. And I would encourage anybody to reach out and say, hey, look, I, I want to explore this. I want to ask questions. I want to see if this is something for me. Now make a decision, not be closed minded that, hey, I, I don't have a problem. I don't care. It's not that bad. But be, be cognizant of it and get out there. And, I, and for me, I'm being vocal about it for two reasons. One, I, to get the message out. And two, because I think being open and being authentic helps people relate to you. And, and for me, I had people that were, um, I'm a buyer in, in my industry and I've had sellers that we had this buy sell relationship. I didn't know them that well. I know who they were probably avoided them because they didn't want to talk to them about something. I wasn't going to buy from them. And all of a sudden they message me and they say, Hey, what's up? You know, I don't drink too. And you're like, what? how long? And then they start telling their story. And all of a sudden, like, we're having this dialogue of, of about something on a personal relation, a personal connection. And I, my mindset of who that person was instantly changed. They're not this person I'm trying to avoid or this person, like, I don't connect with. All of a sudden, they're like, hey, this could be uh, somebody I'm friends with. This could be somebody I relate to. And screw talking about business. If that's meant to happen, it'll meant to happen. But I've made a, a connection of on a personal level, which to me is way more important than this transactional relationships we're out there trying trying to get to. So um, I just can't yeah. emphasize case, enough. Case just, in point. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. So um that's, that's really what I wanted to cover, what I wanted to talk about. Is there anything, but some parting words of advice you would give to, to people? Yeah, I think if somebody is interested in knowing what this life is like to be uh, sober curious or to be mindfully drinking, is to maybe just be aware of the reasons why you're drinking, to maybe keep a journal, uh, a drinking journal, a tracker, understanding like, you know, how many you are really drinking. There's really good resources out there that you can look at. Um, my website is graytonic.com. There's a lot of blogs and resources on there, as well as possibly joining my private Facebook group, Question the Drink, which is just such a chill place. We have all types of drinkers in there. It's just a casual place to be. You can gain some information, understanding some commonality with other people. Some are just, you know, still drinking every day, just trying to understand this whole kind of life. Some are sober for years and everything in between. So there's many options for people to have. They don't have to feel like they have to go cold turkey. 
there's no reason to do that. You can test the waters and really start to understand why you're drinking in the first place. Because that's really what it comes down to. It's not about the alcohol. It's the reason why you're choosing to drink. And once somebody can start to understand that and figure that out is when they start to have success. Exactly. So I think you've mentioned it a couple of times, but Carrie, where is one place people can find you if they want to connect to you? Yeah, I think a great place for someone is to join the Question the Drink private Facebook group. It's easy to find. Just Question the Drink. That's it. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'll put that, that link on my show notes on the website and along with some other points of, of reference to contact you on some other sites. So it'll be real easy to connect you. And I just want to end this conversation with this. If you're out there, anybody that's out there that says, hey, I, I'm not sure about my relationship with alcohol and you don't know where to turn send me a private message, send me a DM. I don't care who you are, where you're from, what you're up to, just send it to me. I am in no way a coach, but I know people like Carrie and I could get you connected to the people that are going to make a difference in your life. So I could be just a sounding board and I can talk to you about my experience with it and maybe you relate to it and maybe you need a little bit of a referral to somebody else and I can help make those introductions. So thank you, Carrie, so much for coming on board and talking about um, your passion. And I think this is a topic that needs a ton more attention and we all need to realize like, hey, we don't have to be quiet about this. We don't have to be anonymous. The more we explain the things that we go through as as an individual, the more other people relate that, hey, I'm not so different and I can, I can find help for what I'm struggling with. That's right. There's so much healing when it comes when we can share our story. So thanks for sharing yours with me tonight. And thanks again for having me on. Really love it. All right. It. Thanks a bunch. And we'll get this up soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Make sure to visit our website, therealnatepayo.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes so you'll never miss an episode of All In. While you're at it, if you found value, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if simply tell two friends about the show. Looking to connect? You can find Nate Payo on LinkedIn or Instagram.